Hello, everyone. My name is Brigadier General Michael Bruno, and I am the Chief of Staff for the Colorado Air National Guard. I am joined today by citizen airmen from five states who are Alaska, California, Colorado, Florida, and Hawaii, who are participating in an electromagnetic warfare exercise in the National Capital Region this week. To simulate the de deployment of the Space Electromagnetic Warfare Countercommunication System to an austere environment. I now ask that each member of the panel please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Senior Master Sergeant Mark Lockwood. I'm the Superintendent of the 213th Space Warning Squadron up in Alaska. We're deployed in place. I started in space 34 years ago in the Navy and uh, enjoy serving in Alaska. Hello, I'm Technical Sergeant Mike Letko from the Florida Air National Guard. Got six years of experience in the space mission set and deployed with that in 2021. Good morning, Lieutenant Colonel Mark Masterson, commander of the 216th EWS Squadron in California, representing the California Air National Guard. I have 19 years of experience and I've deployed to US CENTCOM twice. Aloha, I am Airman First Class Nancy Viscara with the Hawaii Air National Guard. I am an electronic warfare operator and I have been with my unit for three years now. Captain Bon Franks from Colorado with 14 years of experience and one deployment to uh, Africa. Thanks, everyone. Superiority in the electromagnetic spectrum is a precursor to all operations in all domains. Therefore, we need to win the fight in the EMS to win the fight in all other domains. EMS is the lifeblood of Department of Defense operations, as DOD is dependent on spectrum access in all bands to meet its national security missions. This exercise demonstrates an invaluable operational ca capacity and capability used every day by U.S. Space Command and the combatant commanders in defense of our nation. Our three Air National Guard Space EW squadrons have continuously deployed since 2018 in support of combatant commander operations, providing 60% of the Space Force's Space EW capabilities. These airmen are among more than 1,000 Air National Guard citizen airmen based in seven states who perform or support space missions every day, yet remain un unaligned with their natural active component mission partner, the U.S. Space Force. The establishment of a Space National Guard would preserve the combat readiness of our ANG space units and leverage this capacity and resident space expertise to support our national defense strategy. A Space National Guard remains the most cost-effective and efficient option for Space Force to maximize capability and capacity through an operational reserve. An integrated Space National Guard will align efforts under one service, reduce bureaucracy, enable common space warfighter culture and training, and can be accomplished through the transfer of existing Air National Guard resources at no additional cost to taxpayers. Our National Guard warriors perform vital space missions, and in Colorado, they have done so for the past 27 years. Air National Guard space units defend our nation on behalf of combatant commanders across various mission areas, including missile warning, space domain awareness, satellite command and control, military satellite communications, space EW operations, space test and training, and analysis of space intelligence. A Space National Guard provides real value. The value proposition of the National Guard lies with a predominantly part-time force structure. We make 20% of the joint force at 4% of the Department of Defense's budget. According to DOD analysis, the reserve component per capita cost ranges from 28 to 32% of their active component counterparts per capita costs when not mobilized. The National Guard Dual status authorities bring distinctive advantages to homeland defense and allow governors access to capabilities for use in communities during natural disasters or times of emergency. National Guard space professionals provide invaluable reach into local communities, connection to industry, as well as access to and relationships with partner nations through the National Guard's state partnership program. U.S. space Command has assessed 82 nations for potential engagements and development through security cooperation activities. 45 of these nations have state partnerships. Establishment of a Space National Guard 
will further enhance these relationships. The DOD's recent analysis determined that if a Space National Guard is not established, it will take the Space Force a minimum of seven to 10 years to regain the expertise and career field qualifications currently that currently reside in the Air National Guard space units. With one-time costs of at least $644 million, plus annual costs of approximately $100 million, and an in-strength increase to replace approximately 1,000 full and part-time guard authorizations. Additionally, this option drives significant costs yet to be determined for the Air Force to remission current Air National Guard space units to new Air Force missions. A Space National Guard can be established at no new cost to the Department of Defense with a simple zero balance transfer of existing program resources to continue to fund that continue to fund existing guard space missions at current levels to meet Space Force mission requirements. The only cost, and it's a one time cost, would be approximately $250,000 for new heraldry, clothing, and unit sighted items. But this $250,000 can be funded with existing National Guard appropriations. So again, no, no additional funding, no additional military construction. Presently, there is no Department of the De Air Force requirement for growth in the National Guard space units. The department controls growth through funding, basing, and federal recognition. Therefore, a Space National Guard would be established with the existing 14 units, and any further growth would be determined by the Department of the Air Force. National Guard space units must navigate through the Air Force chains of command before reaching necessary coordination with the Space Force. These added bureaucracy and lack of advocacy will ultimately erode readiness over time. I'd like to now turn it over to our uh, the media, and if you have any questions for myself or for the panel. Hi, this is Carrie Williams with a Reserve and National Guard magazine. Um, I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how a Space National Guard would, kind of what impact or um, effects that would have on uh, the state partnership program, kind of where, what potential you see in, in that aspect of a, of a Space National Guard. So as I mentioned earlier, first of all, thank you, great question. So as I mentioned earlier, US Spacecom is actually uh, going out and assessing 85 different nations that they would like to build those partnerships with. The fact that the National Guard already has relationships with 45 of those nations through the state partnership program just gives them a vehicle to actually start those relationships with those countries. So the most important part of the state partnership program is the actual partnerships. So U.S. Spacecom can work with the partner state uh, and the space missions that are inherent in the uh, Space National, in the Air National Guard at this time uh, to advocate and help those nations as we go forward. Does that answer your question? I think so, yes. Thank you. Of course. Hi, this is Teresa Hitchens with Breaking Defense. Thank you for doing this. Um, my question is about the proposal that the Space Force has put forward, which is kind of, as I understand it, a hybrid solution to uh, guard and reserve um, components. And could you talk about um, perhaps maybe the challenges of that? Uh, since since you all are advocating for the creation of a separate space guard, um, and the service seems to believe that this in, this kind of middle solution would solve a bunch of different problems. So could you maybe address that? Thank you. Of course, and thank you for the question. So you're talking about the Space Force Personnel Management Act. So we also call it the single component, which is part in full-time forces that will all be in U.S. Space Force. So in addition to that, we think we're actually okay with, uh, I guess I don't get to say I'm okay with, but US Space Force actually adopting that program along with having the Space National Guard capability. So establishing the Space National Guard at the same time as they're pursuing these options 
will give them much more flexibility. And that's why we're still pushing for a Space National Guard. The, uh, they have not released a whole lot of information on the, the uh, continued continuum of service uh, legislative uh, process that they're trying to go through right now. So I can't speak directly to it, what it will provide. Uh, however, I do know that it will include part and full-time forces, uh, with the full-time forces being a, uh, a majority of the operational forces, whereas in the National Guard, um, all of our forces, both part-time and full-time, are operational. So, Teresa, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. It actually helped. It, it helped um, me. And if you don't, if if you don't mind, I'd like to pose a second question um, here, and and that is the question of what is what is the current um, how are guards people who are assigned the space mission right now currently working those missions? Are they reporting up through Air Force components or how is that? Has there been an effect of this kind of limbo situation on actual activities or are people continuing to do the jobs they were doing in the past? Great question. I'll open it up to the panel. I can take that, ma'am. Uh, Colonel Masterson, California National Guard. Yeah, it, it poses a challenge for us, um, especially with the young members. Uh, I think this more seasoned people can understand reporting to two different chains of command. On a daily basis, I report to the governor and the California National Guard, but with that, I'm activated to go to combat operations. I have to go through the, the uh, Space Force chain of command, which I don't normally work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Being seasoned, I can kind of handle that because I've, I've seen the joint environment, but a brand new individual, a guy or gal, I don't think they should be able to have to understand that they have to report to two different uh, bosses for operational readiness and training. It, it poses a lot of challenges. Thank you. You're welcome. Chris, if I could follow up on uh, just part of my answer also. So the great thing about the value added to having the National Guard involved in this is we are organized, trained, and equipped to do our federal mission. So that is our job, is the combat reserve to the active duty component that we report to. But because of that organization, training, and equipping, and because of the different legislation that goes along with being in the National Guard, we're able to provide those services to our communities, uh, such as during wildfires, uh, floods, um, natural disasters, state emergencies, we're able to provide an additional service to our communities and our fellow citizens. So that's another benefit of, of having the National Guard uh, instead of just having this single component of part-time and full-time Title X U.S. Space Force folks. So. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, this is Carrie again with Reserve National Guard Magazine. Um, I just wanted to kind of give an opportunity to um, everyone else at the table to kind of talk about kind of their personal experiences, um, kind of how they feel that they might personally benefit or their units might benefit from the creation of a Space National Guard. I'll take this one. Uh, this is Senior Master Art Lockwood from Alaska, and uh, it's going to benefit us immensely. Uh, one, we would have uh, a controlling agency. Right now, we're serving at the convenience of another agency. Our career field does not exist um, in the Air Force, and it also we're not part of the Space Force. So we're on we're we're operationally excellent. My operators are the best uh, operators in the world. Unfortunately, um, if something doesn't happen, there are talks about taking the number of people that we have that are amazingly experienced space professionals. Um, and turning us into another job uh, that aligns in, in with the Air Force. So um, there's a very real possibility that my centuries and centuries of experience, if you add up all my operators, we've got hundreds of years of experience. Uh, we could be building runways in uh, in Anatubic Pass or, or through the Brooks Range. It's a very real possibility. Um, so having a controlling agency that we answer to so that we can continue to bring our, our experience, our excellence, um, and serve the people that we need to serve, are the, the taxpayers. It's so important that we have uh, a Space National Guard. Right now, we're serving at the, we're, we're on a tightrope. 
Uh, so we, we would really benefit from having a, a parent organization. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Agency Viscara uh, with the Hawaii Air National Guard. Uh, for me personally, I would be more amenable, more flexible as far as like moving because I'm, I mean, different place in my life. But for those uh, in my unit personally, I think um, the ties to home and family are really strong out there. Uh, but more than half of, of my unit members are from Hawaii, are from the islands. And just ties to home is really important. So having the space unit component would really be, I think, a great opportunity for us there because uh, like the general said, we, we have natural disasters out there. We have volcanoes, we have hurricanes, we have floods. So we can be both, we can both benefit the state and the federal if we need to. And just, uh, just the people out there, you know, a lot of family, a lot of aloha. And yeah, it's it's just um, a lot of great people that I work with. And as far as uh, the training, I've had the opportunity being the youngest member here um, to work with space professionals already going to technical school and as well as um, some on the active duty side. So it's uh, it, I think it, it'll be a smooth transition for us to have that space to, or air to space transition. So that's it. Hi, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Masterson again. Uh, something I want to bring up that I think gets lost is uh, if you look back in history of how, say, you fly F-15s and the active duty, and then you want to fly F-15s and the Air National Guard, it's a it's a really easy relationship um, to to transition from one platform to the other, and then you're in the same career field. What I'm worried about going forward is that I don't think space operators in the space force are going to leave uh, their their weapon system and then come over to the Air National Guard because it's a it's a different service. I think what's going to happen is your space uh, operator in the Space Force will go into industry before they would go into the Air National Guard because it, it doesn't make any sense. And the longer this happens, I think that cultural divide will, will only widen, um, if that makes sense. I think that kind of tapping into that it, one value add that we seem to to benefit from greatly right now, especially in Colorado, is the number of commercial and defense firms that that work there that enable uh, really fruitful employment for a lot of our our airmen and officers that have these extremely valuable jobs that are very technically difficult and arduous that they can bring that expertise then to work with us and whether they work on a GPS contract. Uh, you know, in their civilian career, they can then bring that expertise, even though we're not, we're not GPS, they can bring a lot of that antenna theory and a lot of these very sophisticated skills uh, to the warfight and, and work for us and really educate us and make us more aware of the, the broader space environment. Hi, this is Teresa again, and I, I have another question. It's kind of sideways, though. Um, uh, in the press release, it was mentioning that you guys were involved in an electronic warfare exercise right now. Could uh, And I came in a little late, so uh, forgive me if you talked about this and I missed it. Um, but I'm just interested in the exercise and what you were doing. And because space electronic warfare is a mission that's not done by other, it's not done by non-space professionals, if you see what I'm saying. So I, I think it relates to the question of gar uh, guard skills. And maybe you could talk to the exercise and and that issue. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, good question. Yeah, um, I, I think what, what you bring up, uh, what resonates with me really quickly is experience. I've been in with uh, the electronic warfare system that we operate 10-1 uh, and 10-2 for over 13 years. And when I run into an a active duty Space Force member, it's no discredit to them, but they might be on the system for 18 months and then move on. So sometimes to build an exercise, it's a 12 month process. So uh, we're the resident experts right now uh, for space uh, live fire exercises. Can you just get kind of an overview of what this specific exercise is? Yeah, uh, ma'am, do you have a, a reference of what the of what the exercise is called? Um, yeah, just one sec. I have to pull up the pull up the thing. Um, it just says the squadrons are, are participating in exercise an exercise deployment of the space electronic 
No, space electromagnetic warfare counter communication systems assigned to these ANG space states. Okay, so I think it's a it's just a broad spectrum of, of the exercises that we conduct. Um, one thing we have in uh, that, that makes the squadron operate on a day-to-day -day basis is called mission essential tasks or METs. And to meet those, we need to exercise. So uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, maybe call it three, four times a year, where we're training to do these exercises and we're practicing to go into the field and uh, deny or degrade enemy communications. That can be um, anywhere from a 14 to 17 person crew. And like I said, those, those exercises can take up to a year to develop. So you said that normally you do these three, three to four times a year, is that correct? Yes, um, and it also ebbs and flows on the on the world uh, on the world you know picture the world scene. So de depending on um, as events unfold, like when we were in Afghanistan, we would mostly go uh, and practice counterterrorism type operations, and now we're looking forward to uh, exercises that might include the Pacific or or UCOM. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. So the uh, folks that are here, again, they're representing the uh, different states, uh, the seven states that are uh, performing space missions in the Air National Guard. Uh, they are, like the Colonel said, they're practicing their METs, their mission essential tasks, because that is a requirement that they stay current on all their tasks. So currently, um, we always have one of our Air National Guard units deployed. But usually that unit will deploy on equipment that's already in place. So they don't get a whole lot of practice of loading the equipment up, putting it on an aircraft, landing somewhere in an austere location. And that's what this is practicing, unloading the equipment, setting it back up, and then doing the connectivity that they're required to do. So, and then packing it back up, shipping it back home. So this is giving them the practice on those skill sets that unfortunately they're not getting an opportunity to do in the real world at this time. Thanks. Of course. Did you have any questions, sir, that you wanted to direct to our panel? So I was thinking about asking uh, Captain Franks. So if a Space National Guard is not established and they do create this continuum of service, which is part-time and full-time um, active U.S. Space Force, uh, thoughts on what you would do? Would you do another career? Would you transfer? Okay. Uh, I think it's kind of a, it's a complicated question because I know a lot of my counterparts, including myself, have uh, civilian careers that we've, we've established and we've worked up uh, in Colorado and California, the states that we, we represent. Uh, and, and really that's, uh, that's where we spend the preponderance of our time and we love serving and, and truly we have a great network of people that we, uh, a lot of us in the, the Air National Guard seem to know each other as we, we work in this very small space community where uh, faces become familiar, and so we can come out to an exercise in D.C. and you know everybody. And that's uh, wasn't wasn't necessarily the case for me on active duty. Uh, so I, I'd probably look at continuing pursuing my my civilian career over uh, maneuvering somewhere where I would then be subject to to PCSing to Greenland or or somewhere else where where my civilian career I'd have to to let go. Sure. Can I speak to that as well. Um, Thanks, Sergeant Mike Letko. I specifically left active duty after about seven years of service because the guard really attracted me to the opportunity to serve my community um, with the Florida Air National Guard. Hurricanes are something we deal with frequently and it provided a unique opportunity to still serve the federal military but also the local community. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to, to return to that community and look at the potential for staying there for a uh, longer period of time that active duty allows. So um, I pursu uh, specifically pursued the guard for the, the um, community aspect, and I want to continue to do that. Is there anything else anybody would like to bring up since this is your opportunity? <clears throat> So the value that is my operators and, and really all the guardsmen 
offer is uh, it's it's a little bit intangible, but if I can't explain it, we're under we're wearing these suits. Um, if there's something that comes up, we get called in. We've got a ton of time on the weapon system. Um, we're actually there long enough to become experts I and mean, truly experts at what we do. And uh, so you have all the advantages of having um, civilian experts and then none of the disadvantages of trying to get them to get in during an emergency. Um, COVID was a great example. We weathered COVID just fine. Uh, we didn't have to worry about any kind of contracting or how are we going to get these people over here. We had the most experienced operators in the world on the console all the time. We, we run a 365-day-a-year mission, and we had the best people continuing through COVID. Last summer, up in Alaska, we had a 76,000-acre um, forest fire. All non-essential personnel, to include civilians, were evacuated. Uh, my guardsmen uh, ran the mission and uh, did so without complaint. There was no overage, no budget uh, wickering that needed to be done, no uh, no, no, no backroom deals. They were on the schedule, they showed up to work, and they performed excellent. So it's a really important component. Um, we add experience to the active duty, and we are flexible, unlike the civilian uh, component. So it's a really, really good thing, and it, it would be a shame to uh, to lose all of this experience. All right. If there's no more questions, I kind of want to leave you with, lead you all with uh, a couple quotes. So first of all, General Saltzman, who is the chief of staff of Sp uh, U.S. Space Force, during testimony hearings, called the capabilities in the Air National Guard space units critical and must-haves. And then when asked for his best military advice, uh, he said he wanted the the whichever COA that they decide to pursue, and that's the status quo, which he said is untenable. And we talked about that a little bit in this room just now, that keeping the space professionals in the Air Force while Space Force develops their own culture, their own way of doing deployments, their own basic training, they have their own core values now. As their culture changes, it becomes harder and harder. So that is unattainable. The other one is to create a the new force, which we talked about earlier, which is the part-time, full-time force within the Space Force. And the third one was to establish a Space National Guard. When asked what, which COA he would prefer, his best military advice is the one that uh, does not give me a gap in capabilities and the most is the most cost effective. In our opinion, that is the Space National Guard option. So if we move the forces back into U.S. Space Force, so the equipment and they get their own 1,000 billets, it's going to take seven to 10 years to rebuild that skill level qualification gap that currently resides in the Air National Guard. It's also a difference of $644 million to $250,000 that's already allocated in the National Guard to set them up and change out name tapes, go from the spice brown to blue, change the rank on the enlisted folks, get some new signage, get some new heritage uh, guidons uh, and heraldry type items. So the most cost effective and the means that will keep the capabilities um, available to our combatant commanders is to establish a Space National Guard. 